Hi guys, this is Olivia. So now we're doing part three of our chapter 12 for acids and bases. And what we're covering on this one is how the different things to measure pH and um, how to measure different concentrations and calculating concentrations. All right, so the first part is measuring an acid B, uh, pH. Okay, so we can use pH indicators and pH indicators are basically papers or um, that change color depending on your pH. So they're color changing papers. Uh, or it doesn't just have to be a paper, it could actually be another chemical component as well. So it's a color change. Now we have litmus paper and litmus paper does change colors. So if you get a red color change, means you have an acid. And if you get a blue color change, it means you have a base. And this is for litmus paper. So in this case, you see the litmus paper going into the solution and the solution, the litmus paper turned blue. In this case, he has a base. We also have pH paper, also known as universal, um, universal pH paper, and it gives you a color and a number associated with it. So you have a color and number associated with that uh, universal pH um, paper. Now with universal pH paper, the, the more reds you are, the more acidic the neutral colors tend to be closer to the light orangey color and then when you get blues those dark colors there you're more basic we have something called phenolphthalein it's a compound that also changes color it changes into pink if you have a base okay so um Sometimes people like to call it a deep pink or magenta or whatnot. But if you have a, a base, you're going to get a nice pink color. Okay. Now, uh, phenolphthalein is commonly used in titrations inside our bar labs. Uh, the other thing that we could do when it comes to measuring pH is using a pH meter. Uh, this example right here though before we go into that this example is just showing us universal ph paper used to measuring the ph's of our swimming pool right so how do we apply it in real life almost everyone has a swimming pool or uses water of some sort right when you're taking a bath and whatnot um, we got to make sure that the water we are putting our bodies through is actually safe okay. now we could determine the ph of something a precise measurement by using a pH meter. So pH meter gives you precise, um, precise measurements of your hydrogen concentration. So it gives you those precise measurements of your pH. All right, so now we're going to go into titration. So we're going to have something called acid-base titrations, and we want to know how to precisely uh, find the concentration of an acid base inside of a lab. So I'm going to copy these down, and you guys can copy them down as well. All right, I went ahead and I wrote down our steps. So the first thing is we're going to prepare a basic solution with the known concentration. Usually this is done with a solid um, base, and we turn that solid base into a basic solution but we were able to actually measure the grams that are used and then convert that into moles uh, second part measure the volume of acid and add indicator so usually using a volumetric pipette um, we're able to add our acid into an erlenmeyer flask this right here is an erlenmeyer flask and we're going to add some drops of the indicator so your setup you're going to have an Erlenmeyer flask. Inside your Erlenmeyer flask is going to be your acid that was measured. Okay, so measured. Oh. Measured. So you're going to know exactly how much you have. And you're going to have phenolphthalein in there.
So your solution is going to be what color? Clear, right? Because it's an acid. So you're going to have a clear solution inside of here. Um, phenolphthalein only turns pink when you have a base. So there is your solution. And then you usually have this on a stand. And above a stand, you're going to connect something we call a burette. So a burette is going to go in here. And that's just basically another measuring device with a drip system. Okay. And inside our burette is going to be our base. So you're going to most, uh, fill the burette with the base. So this is going to have your base inside of it. You're going to fill it all the way to the top. And then your base is going to fall inside of your Erlenmeyer flask, right? Now, as it falls in there, you're going to actually be uh, turning it, right? So uh, mixing it together with your other hand. So one hand opens up the knob. So there's going to be a little knob here for your burette. Okay, a little knob. And you turn, oh, you can see it here in the picture, the knob. Okay, so you turn it one way and it opens and the other way it closes. So this one is closed. And here in the upright position, that is open. And it just starts spilling. As you can see in this one, um, as the base goes in, you get the slight pink color inside. Eventually, when enough base, when your solution turns basic, you're going to get a very clear pink color. Now, if your color turns super pink, like super magenta, you went too far, too far. You're past what we call the neutralization zone. Okay, so you only want to add just enough base to neutralize your acid. Now, in our example, if I had hydrochloric acid and I'm mixing it with sodium hydroxide, right, I will end up with a salt and water, okay? So this neutralizes, and this is what you have. When you get too much of a basic solution, you're actually going the opposite direction. Remember Le Chatelet's principle, um, where we said you could go one way, but then you could also go the other way, because you have your conjugate acids and your conjugate bases. Okay. So remember, um, in titrations, only go as far as you need to, which is that neutralization point. You could check it out using your phenolphthalein and get that slightest pink, or you could actually use a pH meter. Now, the moles, because this has been neutralized, the moles of your reactant are going to equal to the moles of your product. That's something to know. So the moles of our reactant are going to equal to the moles of our product, which also means that the moles of our hydrochloric are going to equal to the moles of our hydroxide. So our sodium hydroxide in this case the quantities that we have because it's been neutralized. So neutralized means we have equal amounts. The equations that we're going to use for this is molarity of our acid times the volume of our acid is eventually going to equal to the molarity of our base times the volume of our base. So that's when we've reached a nice neutralization point. All right, so we're going to use this equation to solve the following problem. A 25 milliliter sample of hydrochloric acid is neutralized by the reaction with 17.4 milliliters of 2 molar sodium hydroxide. What was the concentration of hydrochloric acid in the unknown sample? All right, so let's go ahead and do this example problem. Okay, so we have 25 milliliters of hydrochloric acid. So this is volume A. Um, we do not know the concentration of our HCl, so MA is unknown. Our um, base, we have 17.4 milliliters of our base, and that's going to be volume of base. And we have a 2 molar Actually, that's not going to fit there, so I'll just write it here. A 2 molar concentration of our base. So that is concentration of our base. So we're going to now use the equation that was given to us right here to solve that problem. 
So MA is unknown. I'm going to start it here, and then I'm going to move it down this way. Okay. MA is unknown, so I'm going to put X. Volume of A was 25, and that is equal to the concentration of my base, which is 2, times the volume of my base, which is 17.4. So now X is equal to these multiplied together divided by 25. So I'm going to take 17.4 times 2 divided by, what was that, 25. End up with 1.392 molarity. And then I'm going to fix that in a little bit to show um, significant figures. I just want to make sure that we are doing it correctly. Okay, so we wrote down all our different steps. Okay, we have our problems. So 2 times our concentration times the volume divided by the volume. And it gave us 1.39 molarity. Now let's double check our significant figures. 3 significant, 3 significant, 3 significant. And this answer is given to us in 3. My answer has four. I am going to actually get rid of that two right there. And now I'll we'll have three significant digits. All right, so the next one is going to be acid-base titrations with different coefficients. If you notice that this equation was a one-to-one -one ratio, everything was one when you balanced it out. So we're going to look at um, equations that no longer have this easy one-to-one -one ratio. In this example, we're given a 2HCl and some barium hydroxide. Okay, and they're going to produce our salt and water. But you notice the concentrations are different. The difference now is that we're going to be adding that uh, coefficient here at the bottom. So same equation, but now the coefficient is at the bottom of our equation. So let's write this equation down. So this is titrations with different coefficients. And we have 2 HCl plus some barium hydroxide produces barium chloride plus our water. This is liquid, aqueous, aqueous, aqueous. All right, so now we can see that we have these different um, coefficients, right? If there's no coefficient in front of it, it just means it's a one. Our equation is going to be mv over our coefficient equal to mv over our coefficient. So this is of your acids, and this one's going to be of your base. All right, quite simple. Let's go ahead and um, look at a problem and solve it. A 50 milliliter sample. Okay, so I'm just write it as I read it. Actually, I'm going to write down all my coefficients and see what I'm going to need later. So M B B B C B. All right, a 50 milliliter sample of H2SO4. H2SO4 is sulfuric acid, so that means my volume of my acid is 50, ooh, 50 not 15, 50 milliliters. Um, is neutralized with potassium hydroxide solution having a concentration of 0.4 molar. So 0.4 molar is the concentration of my potassium hydroxide solution. If 22.6 milliliters of KOH, 22.6 milliliters, was used of potassium hydroxide um, to complete the neutralization, what is the concentration of the sulfuric acid? Okay. So we want to know what this is here. We don't know this. All right. So let's go ahead and solve our problem. Okay. The concentration here. We don't know, so that is going to be X. Um, 
And actually, you know what, let's go ahead and solve for the variables first that we're going to need um, as opposed to writing everything out. So I want to solve for this one, which means I'm going to have to isolate this variable. That's what I'm solving for. So what I'm going to do is multiply both sides by our um, CA, and that caused that one to cancel out. And then I'm going to divide both sides by VA, and then that one cancels out. So I am left with my concentration of my acid is equal to the concentration of the base times the volume of the base times the coefficient of my acid divided by the coefficient of my base times the volume of my acid. Whew. All right. Now that I have that, let's go ahead and start. So my concentration of my acid is equal to MB, which is 0 0.4, times volume, 22.6, times the coefficient of A. All right, so the coefficient of my acid, which is uh, H2SO4, where did I, did I write that down incorrectly? I wrote HCl. Okay, no, um, I just, we need to write the equation down. That's what we need to do. This equation is not for the problem. So let me actually put a line here, and that way we don't get confused. So let's read the problem, and then we could solve. Okay, we have H2SO4 plus KOH reacting, and they're going to form water and a salt. The salt is going to be potassium sulfate. All right, now we have to make sure everything is actually balanced. Okay, um, so we're going to need two potassiums here, K2SO4. And the way I know this is because hydroxide has a negative one charge and there's one potassium. Potassium has a plus one. So you're going to need two of these to balance out the negative two of the SO4. All right. So now that we have that, now I can balance it. Two potassiums means I need to put a two here to get two potassiums. But you notice that now I have more um, OHs. So I have two four hydrogens. So I'm going to go ahead and put a two here, and that's going to give me four hydrogens. Um, that's also going to change my oxygens. I have two oxygens, two oxygens. Perfect. Um, one is a four, one is a four, so everything else is just a one. Right. Now I could solve my problem. The coefficient of A, which is my um, acid, is one. And now I'm going to divide that by the coefficient of B, which is my potassium hydroxide, and that is 2. And I'm going to multiply it by the volume of 22.6. Oh, actually, the volume of my acid, which is 50. All right. Let's go ahead and solve. 0.4 times 22.6. Divided by 2 equals to that. Divided by 50 is equal to the that. So I got 0 0.0904 as my concentration of my acid. Okay, And the number of significant figures should be 3, and that is 3 significant figures. Let's see how we did. Okay, we wrote down the equation, and so far our equation in looks good. Okay. What we did forget to put is the states of matter, aqueous, aqueous, liquid, aqueous. So now, okay. put all our steps down and we ended up with the same problem. So we did how uh, we did this correctly. All right. It always makes me happy when I do a problem correctly. So. Now, what are the different steps taken here? Okay, so that was one of the steps that we did, but could we've also solved this in a different way? Yeah, we could have solved this using stoichiometry. So this was like step one, but we also have step two, which is stoichiometry. So this is um, 
or not step, but like form one or yeah, like I'm going to call it form one. And now this one's going to be form two. And this one is using stoichiometry. And we're going to get the exact same answer. Because remember, there's always more than one way to solve a problem. So in stoichiometry, we're starting with our volume. And from volume, we're going to get moles. Remember, moles is the center house of everything. And this is going to be moles of our base, volume of our base. And the reason we're starting with the base is because our final goal is that of the acid. Moles of the acid to the concentration of our acid. Okay. The way we do this, so from volume to moles, we're going to use molarity to cancel out the um, liters. From moles to moles is the balanced chemical equation. So I'm going to write balance equation. We use those coefficient. And then for moles to concentration is our molarity, which molarity is equal to moles per liter. All right, let's go ahead and work the problem out, starting with the volume of our base. So the volume of our base, we're going to turn it into liters because we're working with molarity. And if you recall, there is a 1,000 milliliters in one liter. So we're just going to move this number or this decimal over three times. So we end up with 0 0.00026, that's, let's see, 1, 2, 3. Nope, I messed up. There's going to be, there we go. That's a 2 right there. All right, so we have our volume. And now that we have our volume, we're going to use our molarity. So my molarity of our base is 0.4, so that's 0.4 moles in one liter that allows liters to cancel out with liters and we're left with moles of our base now that i have moles of my base i'm going to use my mole to mole ratio so the moles of the base comes down here and then the moles of my acid on the top and the moles of my acid is one the moles of my base is two one two so now moles of base cancels out with moles of base. And now I want to get rid of the moles of the base. Or sorry, I actually don't even want to get rid of that. What I want to do is get the volume of my acid in order to get moles per liter. That is my final goal, which is my concentration. So there is 50 milliliters that was used, which is going to be, if I put 50 here, 1, 2, 3. 0 0.050 liters. So now I have moles per liter. I'm going to grab my fancy fancy calculator and we're going to solve it and we should get the same answer. Times 0.4 divided by 2 divided by 0 0.050. Boom. 0 0.904, I forgot that little zero right there. Okay, and this is the molarity of hydrochloric acid. So same exact answer. Two um, different forms of solving the problem. One is using our um, equations for like M1V1 equals M2V2, which is a very common one when it comes to titrations. And the other form is using our stoichiometry. So whichever one works for you, by all means, go ahead and do that. So the last section that we're going to do is buffers and um, with the biology of our pH. So how do buffers work? Well, buffers are basically a solution that contain a mi mixture of acidic and basic components inside of it. And these components prevent the pH from rising too much or lowering too much. So here we have our um, blood walls and our blood cells. And inside our fluids, inside our body, they keep a pH of about 6.8, right? Um, and the blood cells inside our bodies have a pH of about 7. So this is kind of neutral. Yet we're constantly drinking and eating items that are um, acidic or are basic for us. 
yet our bloodstream still maintains a semi-neutral uh, state. Why is that? Well, one, because our body has a lot of natural buffers inside of it. And if it wasn't for these buffers, then um, if we were to consume acidic items, well, we'd um, our bodies would turn too acidic and we could die from that, right? So in our natural... Um, I don't, so, sorry. So in our blood, right? Like I said, it has a pH of 7.4. Now, if the buffers weren't present in our body, then the moment we added a base to it, our body would turn very basic. If the moment we added an acid, our body would turn very acidic. So here's an example. You have pure water, and that's a 7.0. That's neutral. And as you add more acids, you start dropping. So like a 5.0, which is acidic, or a base like 8.93. We try to keep our, our bodies try to keep us closer to that 7 as much as they possibly can. So when we add buffer solutions to any chemical solution, just like how we have in our bodies, then as we add acid, you'll notice that the pH remains very, very neutral still. And if you add a base, it still remains pretty neutral, just slightly basic, but still neutral, slightly acidic, but still neutral. So the way they work is that in order to create a buffer, you need a mixture of a weak acid and its conjugate base or a weak base and its conjugate acid, okay? And you have to have them present in equal amounts, okay? So they have to be present in equal amounts. Um, these buffers will then start consuming whatever comes their way. So H2PO4 will consume excess hydroxides, while HPO4 with the negative two will consume the excess hydrogen. Right, so one is consuming the base and the other one's consuming the excess hydrogens inside of the solution. Eventually, though, you could eat up your buffer. If you add too much of buffer or too much acid, right, your buffer will get eaten up and then your pH will change drastically. Uh, this image, I really like it because what it basically states is that um, you have two guard dogs looking two different directions and that's what a buffer does. One looks at the hydroxides, the other one's looking at the hydrogens in order to protect the solution from any drastic changes. But like I said, if you consume, um, you could consume all of your conjugate base, all of your weak acids by adding too much um, in excess. So your buffer is only going to work to a certain amount of acid or certain amount of base that you're adding to it. So buffers and the biological system, what else do we know? Um, buffers can be overloaded, and you can adjust the pH values of your buffers, okay? And the way you adjust it is by adding a little bit more of your conjugate acid or your conjugate base, depending on um, what kind of buffer you're trying to get. What, where do you want your solution to be pH-wise, right? All right, you guys, uh, that is it that we had for um, our PH in our Chapter 12. We are finally done. You guys take care. Ciao.